Amen, amen. It is good to be in the house of the Lord, amen? Amen, amen. amen. I don't even know if I even need to preach anymore. Thank you, Steve and Mentor for Change for sharing your heart. We do pray um, and we look forward to what God is gonna do through the partnership and how God is gonna use it for his glory. Well, I'm David and I'm one of the pastors here. I just wanted to welcome all of you, everyone tuning in online. So glad that you could join us. Well, we are continuing our series on the book of Galatians And again, this is the only letter that the Apostle Paul wrote that doesn't have an extended greeting. There's a quick greeting, but it is not extended like any other epistle and letter that Paul wrote. And that's because Paul cuts the chit-chat and he goes straight to the point. There's no, so how have you been? You know, what's going on in your life? Like, what have you been up to? Instead, it's hello, and then I am astonished. I can't believe you did that. Are you crazy? What are you guys doing over there? And so Paul gets right into it from the very beginning, mainly because of the important topic at hand and the anger that he has because of all the distortion and confusion that is taking place. Because there were some people in the church who said that Jesus wasn't enough. Right in the previous weeks, we've been learning that there were these people who said you need Jesus and circumcision. You need Jesus and then you need to follow dietary laws. You need Jesus and something else. And Paul was angry and he wanted to correct the Galatians from this false teaching. So Paul gives ample time explaining the gospel and how it's supposed to work. Now, Pastor Tom, he gave us a chart to simplify the order and structure of Galatians, and it's been super helpful. Galatians chapter 1 and 2 is biographical in nature, and it shows that the gospel is true. We've been seeing that. And then Galatians chapter 3 and chapter 4 is doctrinal and shows how the gospel is superior. And then Galatians chapter 5 and 6 is practical. And so you see the progression taking place. Now, before we get to Galatians chapter 5, and this is where I'm going to spend the bulk of my time, I want to quickly touch up on the last parts of Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 through 31, because I think it ties in directly with chapter 5. And so in these verses in Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 through 31, Paul illustrates the difference between believers who rested in Christ only and then those who trusted in the law. By comparison, taking from the story of Hagar and Sarah from the Old Testament. And so if you go back to the Old Testament, Abraham, he had two sons. One by a slave woman, Ishmael, that being Hagar, and the other Isaac by a free woman, that being Sarah. And Paul uses this as an example to show how there are two ways to live. Again, hitting the point that there are those who are free and then there are those who are slaves. There are those who live according to the gospel, and there are those who live apart from the gospel. And so Paul warns us and admonishes us to see, like, just like Isaac, we are children of promise. So stop living like a slave. And then Paul goes directly into chapter 5 because he wants us to see what that looks like practically now. He's been teaching all doctrinal stuff, right? All theory, everything up here, it's head knowledge. And now Paul wants us to be very practical in terms of what the gospel looks like. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to be reading from verses 1 through 15. Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. Let's read what the apostle Paul writes here. And this is God's word. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You are running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. 
I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Those are strong words that Paul is saying. Verse 13, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So here's what we're going to do today. What does gospel living look like practically? Again, starting in Galatians chapter 5, the apostle Paul gets very practical. So that's the question we're going to tackle. How are you supposed to live practically in light of the gospel? And in terms of how we ought to live, Paul mentions that there are two things we are set free from and one main thing that we are set free to. So if you're taking notes, here's the first point. We are set free from this big theological word called legalism. We are set free from legalism. The way we ought to live is in freedom from the law. Now, when you look at the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul addresses a situation where false teachers come into a Gentile church, a non-Jewish church, and they told these early Christians, hey, it's great that you believe in Jesus. That's wonderful. But now, now that you believe in Jesus, you also need to follow the law. Now that you believe in Jesus, you also need to be circumcised. You need to follow these dietary restrictions. There are these holy days that you need to observe. You need to do all of these other things on top of Jesus as well. And it is here that the Apostle Paul gets very angry. What are you doing? What are you thinking? And he's angry and he's upset because when it comes to the gospel, Paul will not allow any misinterpretation or misapplication. So he says to these false teachers, if you buy into all these other stuff you need to do in addition to the gospel, in addition to Jesus, if you believe this to be true, you are putting yourself in the yoke of slavery again. You are nullifying the work of Christ. Why did Jesus die for you then if you think you can fulfill the law yourself? Now, we've been learning the past few weeks that Jesus plus something equals nothing. But Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And so he reminds us again. So when Paul says here in verses 1 through 6, again, it says this. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. Right? If you're going to follow one, you're going to follow everything. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Here's what Paul is saying. You were called to be free. You're not to be under the law anymore. So don't let anybody put you under that yoke of slavery again. Kick these false teachers out. Do not believe the lies. See, the issue that Paul addresses here is what we call legalism. It's the mindset that if you keep the law, if you try really hard, and the better you perform with that, the more acceptable you are to God. And if you get lazy or if you mess up and you fall into temptation, then you lose points with God. It's like saying, look, if I go to church and then I go to the prayer meeting, hey, God's got to be pleased with that. That's surely got to score me some extra points. If I go to the homeless shelter in the afternoon, that's going to add some more points. If I read my Bible, if I pray hard and if I take a rooted class, surely then the Lord will be pleased with me. Look, if I stay clean of sex, drugs, and alcohol, if I'm really good, then I sense God smiling down on me. 
Paul says that kind of thinking is putting yourself under the yoke of slavery. It's a performance-driven relationship. The better you do, the more you enjoy God's favor. The worse you do, the less you enjoy of God's favor. Look, have you ever received a speeding ticket or maybe a parking ticket and you thought to yourself, I knew I should have gone to church last Sunday, right? Or have you gotten out of a ticket and you thought to yourself, whoo, I'm so glad I went to small groups. God bless me this week. I got out of that ticket. Do you ever think like that? Do you ever think that I've been such a bad Christian this week, I feel unworthy to go to church today? Or maybe on other weeks, I feel so worthy because I did good things, I feel so worthy to go to church. You see, all of that kind of thinking is what we call legalistic. It's a performance determines my acceptance with God kind of thinking. My goodness merits God's pleasure. My badness merits God's displeasure. And Paul calls that slavery. He says you're free from that kind of relationship with God. That is not how you ought to live, practically speaking. You are called to be free, and yet how long will you live with guilt and fear? How long will we tie up our acceptability with what we do or what we don't do? When Paul says you are free, do you realize that the basis of the relationship changes? Look. Many of you probably know this story. I shared this already on this pulpit. Many of you guys know of the Christian musician Stephen Curtis Chapman. Many, many years ago, um, his family, they had a horrible accident. On May 21st, 2008, he and his wife had a horrible tragedy. Now, the Chapmans, they have three bio- biological children of their own, but they also adopted three girls from China. And the youngest one, her name was Maria, and, and she... Or, and the, In that picture, she was about five around that time. Well, one of the boys, one of their sons, Will Franklin, was driving home. One was driving on the driveway, and little Maria uh, found out that her brother was coming. So all of a sudden, she broke out, and she started running to meet her brother. Now, Will Franklin, her brother, didn't see her coming out, and he struck her with the car. And we later found out that she passed away. She died. But at the time, as soon as he strikes her, he comes out and he sees his sister all bloodied up. Now, he doesn't know what to do. He panics. Fear takes over. And all of a sudden, he starts to run in the other direction. So one of his brothers, Caleb, runs after him and he brings him back. Now, later on, the ambulance comes and no one knows what's going to happen. Stephen Curtis Chapman gets into the car and follows the ambulance. But before he drives off, he rolls down the window and he yells, Will Franklin, your father loves you. And then they drive off to the hospital. Do you believe that that is what your father in heaven says? Will Franklin, Fred, Sarah, Christine, Chris, Your father loves you, not just when you do good things, not just when you're going to church or prayer meetings and doing all the right things. When you you make your worst mistakes, when you commit your worst crimes, your father rolls down the window and says to you, your father loves you. That this isn't about your performance. This is not about how he loves you on your good days and not so much on your bad days. He says you've been set free from that kind of relationship. So don't put yourself and don't let anyone else put you in that kind of slavery. You have been set free because Christ has taken away all your guilt, all your condemnation and shame. Do not put yourself under the yoke of slavery again, Paul says. That's the gospel. So let me ask you. Do you believe that? Like when you look at God, what do you see? Like what kind of face do you see when you look at God? Like do you see an angry face? Like like this? Like the people on our staff say, I have this angry face. I don't, but that's what they say, you know? Or do you see a disappointed face? Do you see a frustrated face? Or do you see a face that smiles down upon you? Will Franklin, 
I love you. You're my son. You're my daughter. Do you believe the gospel or are you still a slave? Paul says you've been set free. Now, for some of us in here, maybe you're not a Christian yet. Maybe you're checking things out. Maybe you've been invited by a friend. Well, we're glad you're here. Let me just say that Christianity is not for good people. Christianity is not for people who have their act together. They're just sinners who are forgiven. The sinner, sinner saved by, we call it grace, unmerited favor, the kindness of our God. So I don't know where you've been or what you've done, but honestly, it doesn't really matter because that's not the way God chooses to relate with you or with me. Christ came to take away our sin and our shame, and he gave us his righteousness upon us. So that now in Christ, the way we relate with God is he loves us and he smiles upon us regardless of how we live. That's the gospel. But that leads us to the next point. Well, we're free from legalism, but Paul says we're free from another word called lawlessness. On the one hand, we're free from legalism, and now he says we're free from lawlessness. Look at the first part of verse 13 again. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. You see, the interesting thing here is that Paul says you were called to be free, and then the next phrase he says, but do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Like, it's like Paul immediately knew, right? He immediately knew the danger on the other side of the gospel message. He recognized that there's this danger on this other side of the gospel message. And the danger is in legalism, it's the opposite of legalism. It's lawlessness. Now, this danger says this, well, 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 okay. Well, if Jesus died for my sins and it really doesn't matter how I live, pastor, let me get this right. You're saying it really doesn't matter if I go to church. You're saying it doesn't really matter if I pray. It doesn't really matter if I help the poor, serve the poor, help my neighbor. It has nothing to do with my performance. Well, that's great. Then I can do whatever I want because there's no law. Amen, pastor. I like this Christian thing. It's awesome. Now, Paul warns us of this danger on the other side of legalism and its lawlessness. This idea, do whatever you want. There are no rules. There are no obligations. There are no restrictions. Live as you please, if you will. And when the gospel is preached accurately, that danger is always there. So again, he says, do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. And you know how it goes. The problem is if we're left to do whatever we want, what we want isn't good, is it? We have these evil desires that do not naturally want to do what pleases God. Like in myself, left to my own device, I don't want to worship God. I want others to worship me. I want to worship myself. I want others to compliment me. Pastor Dave, you're so good at basketball. You know, like, I want others to worship me. I don't want to pray and depend on God. I want to depend on my own strength, my own self, my own hard work. I don't want to give you money. I want people to give me money, right? I don't want to love others. I want others to love me. Left to myself, that's what I want. So some people get very, very nervous when the gospel is preached because they recognize this very danger. Now, for others of us, maybe, who find ourselves spiritually lazy or indifferent, there is no seeking after God. Maybe there's no desire to serve God and to know him and exalt him. There's no expression of love for others. There's no thankfulness in our hearts. There's no grace. There's no kindness. That is not gospel freedom. The theological term for that is sin, disobedience, and rebellion. Living in the gospel, this freedom does not mean we do not fulfill the law. It doesn't mean we can just live lazy, indulgent, immoral lives. Living in the gospel actually means that we do fulfill the law. 
And so in verse 14, it says, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Now notice what Paul just said here. You're called to be free, yes, but use your freedom to serve one another in love. In other words, the gospel that frees you enables you to serve in love. When you're free by the gospel to love one another, you actually fulfill the law, Paul says. And so living in gospel freedom doesn't free you from the law. It doesn't excuse you from the law. Living in gospel freedom enables you to fulfill the law. And if you look at your life and your life does not fulfill the law, it is not a Christian life. It is not the gospel. Look, I know not everyone in here is married, but let me use a marriage analogy for how this is supposed to work, okay? Suppose a wife says to her husband, honey, I love you. I love you with all of my heart. And as I promised on our wedding day through sickness or health, what come may the death do us part, I will always love you. You know what, honey? Even if you never serve me, I will love you. Even if you never flatter me, I will love you. Even if you never buy me roses or presents, I will love you. Even if you're unfaithful to me, I will love you. There is nothing you can do to change my love for you. Now, what I just described to you is what we call the gospel, okay? That's the gospel. So how might you reply? Well, the legalist says, <laughs> well, I don't know. Will she really love me no matter what? Like, I think I might have to do dishes a few times. Like, I know I have to buy her presents during special occasions a few times. Look, I think I have to buy her some roses, and I got to talk about how pretty she is. Then I think she'll love me more. That's the legalist. I don't really believe you'll love me like that. It's really about my performance. It's really about what I do for you. If I'm a good husband, you'll love me more. If I'm a bad husband, you'll love me less. I don't believe your gospel. I think it's more about my performance than your love. It's about me. It's not about you. It's about how well I do, not about how loving you are. So I'm going to keep doing something. I'm going to keep sweating it out because I don't believe you can love me like that. That's the legalist. Now, the lawless person, on the other hand, says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, pastor, wait a minute. Say that again. I don't have to serve you. I don't have to take care of you. I can be unfaithful to you. Well, hallelujah, sweetie. I'll see you in a few weeks, okay? I'm going to go on a trip with my friends. I'm going to go play some golf. I'll be back in a couple of weeks. Thanks. That's the lawless person. Now, even if I do that, you'll still love me, right, honey? No matter what I do, you'll still love me. Well, fine, I like that. Now, what does a gospel person say? Wow. She loves me like that. No matter what, she'll serve me like that. Even if I'm unfaithful, I can't believe anyone would love me like that. Well, that makes me want to serve her. That makes me want to be faithful to her. Not because I have to, not because I don't think she'll love me if I don't, but just seeing how she loves me in such a way makes me want to love her. That's the gospel. The great engine of the Christian life isn't how much you love Jesus, even though that's a part of it. The great engine is God's love for you. That's what fuels this whole thing. And again, if you're not a Christian in here, I just want to make it explicit. The Christian life isn't about do's or don'ts. Trying to live a clean life. The Christian life is a love relationship with a God who loves you more than you can ever imagine. And when you see how unconditional and unshakable that love is, it kind of want to make you love him back. That's what Christianity is about. So that leads us to this third point. 
If the gospel frees us from legalism, it frees us from lawlessness, what does it free us to? Well, the gospel frees us to love one another. The gospel frees us to love one another. Paul says this. If there's one thing, like if there's one thing we should be doing, it's loving. Like one of the evidences of whether we understand the gospel in our lives, one of the evidences of whether we're set free is that we would love one another, right? Paul says earlier in verse 6, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. He's saying it doesn't matter if you're circumcised or uncircumcised. Uh, Let me extend that a little bit. Like, it doesn't really matter if you go to church or don't go to church. It really doesn't matter if you give your money or not. It doesn't really matter if you pray or not. It doesn't really matter if you're part of the leadership team or not. Like, in and of itself, all those things are wonderful things, and you should do it out of the overflow of your heart of Jesus, right? Evidence is of the fruit. But in and of themselves, Paul says explicitly it has absolutely no value unless it is done with love. Just doing the activities doesn't mean anything. And if it's not about those things, then what is it about? The real measure of being truly set free is whether we love. That's what we're to be known for. Like, do you realize that legalism or lawlessness repels people from Jesus, but love attracts people to Jesus? Like, I see this dynamic at work all the time. Like, sometimes as Christians, we're more known for what we're against than what we're for. And I'm not saying we can't call people out on their sins. I think there's a time and a place for that. But we're more known for what we're against than what we're for. How tragic that is. Look, and I'm not indicting you. I'm indicting myself. And I told this story, but I got to tell it again because not long ago, you guys know the story about my neighbors. Um, Not long ago, I forgot to take out my trash cans, you know, um, because I was too busy doing church stuff. You know what? I was too busy writing a sermon, guys, okay? I was too busy writing a sermon. I didn't have time to put my trash cans out in the curb. So the night before the trash was picked up, Gina and I got a text message from our neighbor, our next door neighbor. And this is what he wrote Hey, David and Gina. Just an FYI that seeing no cans pulled from your house to the curb, and you guys usually beat us to it every week. This is what he wrote. I took the liberty of pulling your trash, recycling, and yard clipping cans. And my next door neighbors are not Christians. Like, I mean, we know each other. We invited each other to each other's homes. I know where they stand. I was so rebuked that night because they were the ones loving us and I was too busy doing church things. I never pulled their trash cans to the curb. So after that incident, I did it multiple times. (laughs) And I'm here to tell you that it's love. God's love for all people Our love for all people that's going to draw people to Jesus. Like reading the Bible, going to church, praying and serving and all great. But if it doesn't lead to love, it means nothing. It's about believing the gospel in such a way that it produces love in one another. And it's not about rules and regulations. It's not about religion. It's about love. And so Paul says in verses 13 through 14, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. True gospel freedom means we're set free from legalism, we're set free from lawlessness, and instead, we're set free to love. Let me give you a couple applications that you can take home with you, and then we'll wrap it up. First is this. Focus on the promises of God, not on your performance. Let me say that again. Focus on the promises of God in your life and not on your performance. 
There's tons of verses in scripture about God's promises for us because your identity rests not on your performance, but it rests in Christ. Jesus doesn't love you more because you do more. He doesn't bless you because you do good things, and he doesn't strike you when you do bad things. Look, you didn't get that speeding ticket because you didn't read the Bible. You got that speeding ticket because you broke the law. You didn't get sick because you didn't go to church. You got sick because we live in a fallen world where sin is present, and ever since, our body has been decaying, yours and mine. Your identity rests in Christ, not your performance. So focus on the promises of God so you don't forget and you know who you are as he speaks truth into your life. And the second application is this. Evaluate whether your life is producing a life of love. Like if you don't hear anything at all, like this is the main thing that matters. You might be busy doing things for God, but have you checked your life, whether or not your life is producing love in the midst of it? Like ever since you came to know Christ, ever since he saved you, do you see a measurable difference in the way you love from that moment till now? Like every year, do you see a growth in your love do you see measurable, incremental growth in how you love and how you treat people, or is it the same? Ask yourself this question, have I been growing in love? Ever since you came to know Christ, would your friends Will your coworkers, will your classmates, will your spouse say that, yeah, you are growing in love, honey? Or you're growing in love, friend? Or would they say, nah, you're just angry. You haven't changed since the moment you got saved. That is the only thing that matters. Have we been growing in love? Have we been growing since we came to know Christ? Because when we're changed and transformed and truly set free by Jesus, the evidence of that fruit is love working itself out. As Christians, what people say of you that you are a loving person? Would your mom or your dad say you're a more loving person after Christ? Would your classmates or your coworkers say, yeah, Henry, Henry, you're a man of love. And he is, by the way. But would they say of you, Because love for God and love for others is the only thing that would draw people to him. That is the only way we are going to affect change and impact the world for God's glory, wherever you're at. That's true gospel living, guys. And if your life is not producing a life of love, if you're not more loving today than the day you first met Jesus, then you are a slave. Church, we are called to be free. And the truest measure of that is whether our lives are producing a life of love. Amen? So go and live in love like you're free. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. And thank you for reminding us what it means to be free and what it look, looks like to live the gospel out practically. That true gospel freedom means we're set free from legalism. 
We're set free from lawlessness and instead we're set free to love. God, would you give us the strength to live in such a manner, to live this out. And may our clarion call and the evidence of knowing you be love to our classmates, to our coworkers, to our family members, everyone we encounter. May love be the main thing. And as we express that love, may others come to know you and experience you. Help us, Lord. Help us all. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.